me quedó un poquito largo el informe, pero les juro que vale la pena. Es casi una enciclopedia de How I Met Your Mother porque hablé con Chris Harris, guionista y productor de todas las temporadas de la serie, que me contó varios detalles del detrás de escena sobre cómo fue que nacieron algunos momentos icónicos de la serie, qué pasó, por ejemplo, con How I Met Your Father y un montón de detalles más. Todo en este extensísimo pero valioso informe sobre How I Met Your Mother. Quédense hasta el final porque les juro que no tiene desperdicio. We now return to Mira Akian and Contre with our latest interview. I was one of uh, just a few writers who were there from the beginning all the way to the end, uh, which I'm very grateful for. And uh, I started out as a writer, and you know, you, you the way it works in TV writing, once you've been a writer for a while, you automatically um, become a producer and, and get producer duties. Uh, and then um, from you know around maybe the fourth or fifth season on, I was basically the uh, Carter and Craig's number two. Are we being punished for something? <laughs> no. Yeah, is this gonna take a while? Yes. I noticed this for the first time in this rewatch is that they never grew. <laughs> they are always, I, they are the same, so... <laughs> you were telling us how you met Mom. In excruciating detail. Did they knew the ending from the very yes. beginning? Yes, so they did, they did, and they, they signed everything. I think the ending was only, I think, the, I think we had two or, we had probably maybe four or five sessions with the kids uh, and most of them were uh, during the first season and then uh, a couple were during the second season and I think it's during the second season when the ending was shot uh, so they, yeah, they, the, the set was closed down so it was only a few people on everyone signed uh, contracts but um, yeah that's the funny thing about the kids Every, we used them for, for nine years but by the time there was like even in the second season you can tell oh they're getting bigger <laughs> they don't look the same yeah. uh, and, and David Henry you could tell was a, was was about to hit adolescence so um, you know if you notice if you watch carefully and no one should watch this carefully but <laughs> if you do well most of the footage we had to reuse it over and over and over again because we only shot a little bit um, so Sue Fetterman our editor By the time we were, you know, a few years into the show, she knew every frame of those kids. And, and there's one where he, go, where he shifts a little bit. Oh, let's use the shift one because uh, we haven't used that in a year. Um, so I, I, I think in retrospect, we, we, we always talked about how, man, it would have been great to just get an hour of footage of the kids saying crazy things. And maybe we would find an episode for them. It was like, what? In the swimming pool? Yeah. Like just, just silly things. And then we could find stuff. Uh, but instead, we uh, we only had that limited footage to use. Stand up, walk over to her, tap her on the shoulder, open my mouth, and speak. Well, Carter and Craig knew the ending from the beginning, I think. And I forget when the writers learned it. It was either first or second season. Um, but yeah, they, they always, you know, that's the, and a lot of, I'm sure I'm, I'm going to say their names a lot because so much of this show was... Uh, was them, and I'm so happy to have been uh, able to contribute to it. But um, yeah, they had they had this vision from the beginning, and I think that's part of what made the show so special. Was um, you know they they kept they they kept every, even though we got to contribute our own ideas and write our own um, shows, uh, they kept it sort of the show close to their vision, and I think that's what made it special to people I, i know that they said like oh if we were canceled after the first season then we'd we'd make victoria the mother i don't remember that happening maybe it happened yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but i but i thought you know i've i've you know i've watched those early episodes with my kids now and one thing that i noticed that i don't think i appreciated at the time was how great ashley williams was as sort of a counterbalance to to robin like they're both great uh characters but They were so different. Robin was sort of, uh, you know, more hard edged and and, um, and and worldly, and Ashley had this sort of more uh, not naive, but a very positive outlook. And I think that worked really well for our first season. You need a plan. You need a wingman. This is so going in my blog. I do know that originally they thought of Barney as sort of like a a bigger, sort of a, obnoxious guy, and I then Neil came into the to test or came into audition and like it was a laser tag scene and he immediately like dove over the chairs and rolled like he really put himself into it and um i mean that's neil though he's amazing and uh i know that uh he totally won over the head of the network when they when they auditioned and there was no question from then on carter and craig came into the the series with this idea that how did barney become who he was um And they, they knew that 
that he or he used to be a hippie. Some it, something happened with uh, with uh, a woman uh, that broke his heart, and that then that led it, and that was going to lead into the basically the Darth Vader <laughs> uh, yeah. creation. story around it um and and had that idea about like okay he's going to deliver the story in bits and pieces as a way of getting everyone else to tell their embarrassing stories as a way of getting ted um it was so fun to to write and and talking about neil patrick harris um it really he's so precise as an actor and so amazing um you know when we're in the edit room uh, we could go from take one to take three to take five, and and his 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 uh, gestures would match perfectly. Like he's so in control, and I think that's why he's so funny. He knows exactly what he's doing at any given point. That week he was sick. He had the flu. Like it was bad. He could barely move. But then every time like the camera came on, vroom, like it just like he he magically yeah. he magically you wouldn't be able to tell a thing. And then, and then they yelled cut and he was just like, it was amazing to watch because he found, an, he, even when he was at his lowest, he found a way to be perfect on screen. Doctor, are you all right? I heard a woman screaming in here. Oh. <laughs> it's so funny because it was, uh, that was one of uh, my episodes. I co-wrote it with uh, Carter and Craig. That was 10 sessions. Um, and, uh, which was also the, the, um, you know, the beginning of the arc with Stella. And um, from my recollection, it sort of came out of the blue. Like we, this was, this was um, sort of at the height of Britney mania. And she was always in the tabloids and doing things. And from what I can tell, they realized on her side that they needed sort of a, a reset, like a reintroduction of Britney. Uh, and they needed to sort of, sort of slow, gent something gentle and something fun. And uh, we just happened to have this role of the receptionist uh, in 10 sessions that wasn't originally um, a giant role. It was just something, it just seemed funny to us that the receptionist was falling in love with Ted as Ted was falling in love with the doctor. And um, we, uh, of course, we said yes. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of TV shows. This was the third season and we were on the bubble. We were, we were not a hit show. We had a core base of fans, but um, the ratings were not great. Um, and when you're a TV show like that, a lot of times you try stunt casting, casting someone famous to come in. Mm -hmm. Usually it doesn't work. Usually people don't care. But this time, people cared. <laughs> like yeah. we had a, the set, we had helicopters. It's hard. It's, it's hard for me to remember now because it seems so crazy. But there were helicopters over our uh, stage. Because it was such a big deal. Oh, Britney Spears, what's she going to do now? What's she going to do next? Um, turns out she was great. Uh, it was the perfect role for her, and it was the perfect role for us. And if you look at the ratings uh, for that season, um, they were they were not great. They were okay. They were not great. And then Britney Spears' episode was our highest rated episode for years. And then when it fell back down the next week, it didn't go all the way down. Like, there was enough that people found... Um, to the show that they kept it going. So it's the one time where stunt casting Yeah, it's it's one of the best episodes uh, because it's got it's got so much. Well, it's got the Robin Sparkles, but it's also the beginning of the slap bet. Yeah. So it's it's got two like two of the biggest things in How I Met Your Mother lore uh, started in the same episode and I think that's what makes it so Amazing, and this was one of um, uh, this was. Courtney Kang did an amazing job writing that episode. It was also one of the these ideas that Carter and Craig had sort of had in their minds for a while. And you know, they you know they they had a band together in college, so music has always been uh, a, a big important thing for them. So we've always you know, How I Met Your Mother always had always had music uh, here and there, so, you know, songs and whether it was uh, a song that Barney was singing or the song in Marshall's head as he's, as he's running through the city or, yeah. or things like that. So um, we're, uh, I think that was a big special part of the show. And yeah, the Robin Sparkles, just the fact that mystery and that reveal 
um, was so fun and, and so great to see carry out through the seasons as we saw more and more of this uh, secret part of Robin's uh, history. Yeah, and what inspired the looks or the music? Uh, it's an 80s, like, it's, it's <laughs> eight, the 80s, but in the 90s in Canada. So yeah, that's... <laughs> it's, it's so funny, and I, and I feel like in the writer's room, they kept saying, well, we want to do an 80s parody, but the timing doesn't, but, the, but she's too young to do an 80s parody. And then I don't remember who it was, maybe it was Stephen Lloyd, uh, said, well, the... The 80s didn't come to Canada until the 90s. And everyone was like, okay, great, now we can do an 80s party. <laughs> Slap bet. We used to do those when I was a kid. What the hell's a slap bet? Whoever's right gets to slap the other person in the face as hard as they possibly can, but no rings. Guess what? They did it anyway, and it's one of the most famous yeah. parts of the show. Like, and, and it's a testament to, to again, to their vision and to them standing by it, even when certain people didn't understand it because they knew that if they loved it, then the people who loved the show would love it. Uh, I think it was stuff. I think it was something they did in college or, or growing up. Oh, so it's, 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 it's real. This slap yeah, the way. yeah, yeah. I, I think they actually did. Or Carter. I feel like I remember Carter talking about uh, stories about doing it with his friends. I can't up, believe which, this. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. But you know, that I mean, that was such a fun part of the show was being able to take you know the best time we had in the writers' room was sitting around telling stories. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes those stories would make it. Uh, into the show. The this, this second episode is about Ted throwing um, three parties in a row, one night one, night two, and night three, in order to in order to get Robin there. That was a roommate of mine when I lived in San Francisco. You know, he, he it wasn't it wasn't every night. It was it was over successive weekends, but we made it three nights in a row. Yeah. Uh, but that's what he did. He was interested in this girl, and he, she didn't show up the first time. So he said, "Okay, we we got all this leftover beer. Let's have another party." And we were like, "I don't want another party." There's something about things, even when you can't tell whether they are real or not, if they're real, the audience will just respond to them more. I don't even, I don't know why, but there's like, you can feel it in the writing and in the performance. If you know that it came from a, a moment in real life, uh, it just makes such a difference in the show. A few real things happened in the writer's room that ended up making it onto the show. Um, the one, the one that I still can't believe happened was it happened, um, to me, there's a flashback to them sitting in the bar and a pencil that's stuck in the ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> it happened in the writers' room. I was we there was a pencil in the ceiling. Um, we were all we were all joking around. We were tossing a ball around, trying to hit, trying to hit this one pencil in the ceiling. And Jamie Roenheimer, who was sitting across from me, he threw the ball up. It just barely knocked the pencil. I caught the ball. But before I could even look up, the pencil fell, bounced off the ball, straight up my nose. Straight up my nose. Everybody froze for about 10 seconds because they thought I might have just died. I thought I might have just died. <laughs> it, 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 it's really dangerous because if, if, yeah. uh, it depends on how deep it went. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, it was, it, and it was up there. I, 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 it was up there. <laughs> and, then, and then there was a moment, there was like 10 seconds, and, I, and then I said, I think I'm okay. And then everyone cheered. It was, hey! <laughs> to understand this story, you need to know that your Uncle Marshall was doing something that lots of college kids do. He was, uh, let's say, eating a sandwich. I'm pretty sure it's Carter and Craig again, I, like, as, we, as with so many of the, the, the greatest things of the show. But it's, it's so funny to me to think about because here's, like, this, guy, this dad is telling his kids about his life, and he's telling them about three ways and about crimes yeah. and about all these awful awful things he did but he won't tell them that he smoked marijuana yeah. it's, like, it's, it's funny to me that that's the one place but it was also like we also loved that we were playing with the idea that he was telling the story to his kids and the kids would hear one thing and the audience would know what he's really talking about um yeah i think it was i i can't remember how it started but that was one of those it was one of those things that once we found it we knew that we could use it going forward in other episodes and those were those were some of the most fun uh, runners the most fun sort of recurring jokes uh, because once we had once we once we had an audience that knew that sandwich 
equals marijuana, sandwich <laughs> equals pot, then if we show someone with a giant sandwich, <laughs> then that's an extra joke. If someone complains that the sandwich, I think, I think it was marinated with other sauces, then oh, then you know, then you know what they're talking about. Then, so it sort of opened up this world for us that we we were able to use uh, over and over again, and that's true for a lot of the 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 runners that start things that started as one joke that we realized, oh, this is a whole world. You know, it's like the intervention banner. Um, I have that here too, uh, which is. Which is awesome. I, that's another one. I can't remember how it started, but um, it, it, it worked so well in stories going forward. The telepathic conversations, even little things like like Marshall saying "lawyered," uh, yeah, you know, it, it made it. To, I think it to us it made it just feel like well, it's, it's what people, it's what friends do in real life. You yeah. know, you, you have your you have your in jokes, you have your things that don't make sense to anyone else, but you know what they mean. And uh, I'd like to think that that's why this group felt so real. Uh, to viewers after a while because you you would that would be your, when he says lawyered that's a joke that oh you you know I, I know what he means by that this song oh, it's the best song in the world it's the only song I like just kidding <laughs> tape's been stuck in the player for like two years why that song uh, how yeah. was like preparing that episode that we still remember that's that's one of my favorite episodes because you know over the course of um, the the show. Again, it's all Carter and Craig's show, but every once in a while, I got to run with an idea that I really sort of uh, got and felt strongly about, and um, that was that was one of them. Yeah, I, I love that. Just I, I, to me, it was obviously the story's about the Fiero, but it's also about you know when where friendships start and 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 where they go and how your life and how your dreams change along the way. And we were using the car to sort of. Um, show that uh the 500 miles I, i i think it was jamie ronheimer who thought up the song but it, as soon as he said it was oh that's perfect we knew that we wanted a song that that just carries through the whole episode um and there's a you know there's a joke when um you know that's one of my favorite montages in the in the series i am so sick of this song don't worry it comes around again marshall and uh ted Uh, listening to that song and playing Zitch Dog, which was a um, a game that my dad played with his friend in college when they took road trips. You never heard it; didn't exist. I typed yeah. it into Google before, during the show. Zero hits. Like so, everything everything Zitch Dog comes from uh, uh, my dad, <laughs> really. Um, and uh, I, what I loved was the that. Yeah, hearing that song over and over and over again, and my, you know, there's, I think Marshall, I think at some point they're cheering, they're singing along to the song, they're singing along to the song. Then you see Ted saying, "I'm so sick of this song," and then Marshall says, "Don't worry, it comes around yeah. again." What do you mean? And I cut to them singing that song again, and that's 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 how I feel. That's 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 how I feel about that song. Just to be the man who walks a thousand miles and falls down at your door. The other thing is Argentina. Your taste. Experience your food. Oh, so good. But in this case, it's like a Caribbean look to, to Argentina. It's crazy. Well, and I, I, I apologize to all of Argentina. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, I, 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 beg, I beg forgiveness. <laughs> yeah. We had, um, you know, every episode is, every episode ends up long and We, uh, you know, we, we always end up needing to cut out scenes or things, some of which we love, some of which we're glad that we cut because it didn't work. Um, and in this case, I, I don't remember exactly, but I remember that there was a, there was a running joke about how uh, to, to stupid Americans, like all countries are the same, like all other countries are the same, like Americans just, just don't have a good understanding of geography. And that was going to be part of the joke was, was this sort of mixture of, cultures and especially because I think I think Robin was there during the summer here which would have been it doesn't make sense the coming back with the braids and everything yeah. uh, I, I, I don't remember I think it just got I, I do know that that was a tricky episode that we were all I think that episode had a lot of issues <laughs> speaking candidly that was not is it, it was probably not my best uh, my best episode and yes that was one of them and Somewhere along the way, the joke got dropped out, but the visuals remained. 
it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but but you you had in in the original script you had like an explanation for it. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. It was it was like I can't remember if it was the I can't remember if it was Ted in present day or Ted in the future, who who's like I, I don't know. I, I get confused by all the you know. It, it was something like that. My body can outrun any motorized vehicle. I'm like John Henry when he beat the steam engine. All I need is a great folk song. Pam Fryman is such an amazing director, and that was that was a challenge because most of the episode takes place on the streets of New York. We're in Los Angeles, so we had to use uh, you know. But most most studio lots have a little bit of uh, a couple streets here and there that that are built to resemble uh, New York or Chicago or whatever you want. And we had to go, we had to go to multiple lots just to film enough to, of them running. And Pam was so amazing in getting it, getting it right. Marshall versus the, machines. the great thing about our, um, music, uh, composer, John Swihart is that we could tell him, I think this is sort of like a, uh, a country, uh, you know, sort of an old, uh, you know, a Western kind of uh, yeehaw, kind of rawhide kind of feel to it, and he was able to create it. I, you know, I, I did the lyrics with with uh, Craig, um, and I, I just love how it came out. And then, yeah, there's like a bonanza kind of uh, feel to the to the screen burning away. Um, it was a really fun episode. I loved how, you know, in that one, everyone was racing because they wanted to be right but also they were each one of them was also racing for a personal reason yeah and this was marshall who wasn't sure if he could have a baby or not we didn't know what was wrong and was getting all worked up about it he was he was going to beat the, the the taxi cabs and the and the and the uh and the subways and everything by running because his body was great <laughs> and of course it was a stupid idea it was, he didn't come close yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, 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 and this, the, the, one of the things that like uh, fuels this episode is the idea of meeting Woody Allen. Did you actually <laughs> think of like having Woody Allen on the show? We we uh, we we did, and uh, I don't think we were able to. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think we were able to get. Uh, yeah, I think I think we I think we tried, and, and for this episode, he, for that episode, yes, yes. Um, so we weren't able to get that, but but we had a we had a really good time with. Uh, <laughs> with, with everyone that we were able to get. After the show ended, you you started to speak about how I met your father. Uh, the show. Yeah. What happened to that? It just didn't quite work at the time for Carter and Craig, and you know, I mean, I think they had a good. They had a show that had a pilot, an idea that they that they really liked, um, and it, I know that CBS had some questions and some thoughts about the way the pilot came out, the first episode came out, and it felt like it was going to be a long process to make it something that everybody loved. And you know, I think Carter and Craig got to a point where they thought, you know, maybe maybe that's maybe we'd like to do. Um, some other things, and I don't. I don't think there's any. I don't think there's any point at which the door is permanently closed. And I know they've talked about it uh, since then too. Um, yeah, but it, they just didn't. Uh, it, they they did a pilot that they were proud of. It was Greta Gerwig was in it. It was amazing. So, um, but it, it at the time I think there were enough questions that it felt like something that everyone said, okay, you know, let's not worry about it right now. Yeah. I and mean, they were tired. It was, it's. It was nine years of this show, so I, I don't blame them for saying, you know what, let's take a break from it. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's do something else.